Jesus Christ our Savior Was born to us a baby They laid him in a manger In Bethlehem that night I sang Jesus Christ our Savior Was born inside a stable They laid him in a manger Sorry, quiet night I sang oh, 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 oh. Everybody, how are you? A joyous advent to you. I hope things are going well in your life. I'm looking forward to being with you over about the next 75 minutes or so. I'm going to try to, there we go, advance this slide and get moving. This is Born the King. This is session number two. You may know from last week we're going to do four sessions. The fourth session, however, will be on Christmas Day. So like I said last week, I was pretty positive you weren't going to show up to hear me teach on Christmas Day. So we're going to send you a video, which will be just a short reflection to kind of summarize things and also send you a challenge uh, for the new year. So uh, look for that uh, sometime before or on Christmas Day. We won't have somebody in the office probably sending it out on Christmas Day. We'll set that up in advance to auto-send. Somebody asked me that last week. You're not going to make one of your staff work on Christmas, are you? Um, no, we're not going to do that. We've got it all planned out. Hopefully the technology works. My name is Chris Fomsby. If I don't already know you and you don't know me, I'm the minister of discipleship here, which means that I have the privilege of working with a very talented team to create experiences, environments, and events for people to grow in their faith. This, this church, of course, is, has a purpose, and our purpose is to build a Christian community where non-religious and nominally religious people are becoming deeply committed Christians. And so what we do is we help people all along their spiritual journey. We help people who are just discovering God, exploring God, saying, I don't even know if I'm really interested in Christianity, but I got a few questions. We help people who are a little further down the road who said, yeah, I think I'm kind of ready to go a little bit deeper. So maybe they show up at worship service and they encounter God. And they encounter God not just in the song and the sacraments and the sermon, 
they encounter God when they see you and interact with you in the worship service and in the spaces there where people are mingling out and about in between services. Some, somebody once asked me, it's like, why do you say that? It's because when we carry that joyful message that is the gospel transformation in our own life, that is also a way for us to show others what it looks like for us uh, to be a picture, if you will, of the kingdom of God. And so they encounter God through worship, they encounter God through meeting you, and we engage in the community with one another when we come and do things like this, when we sit around a table and we study. Last week we didn't have the chance really to go in to give you much time to dialogue. We're going to have a little bit more time to allow you to have some space tonight to chat at your table. I know some of you have said to me, I hate when you make us talk around the table. And some of you have said, I hate when you don't allow us to talk around the table. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those things where you're not going to please everybody. You just do what you're going to do. And I've always kind of said, hey, we'll do our best and we'll try to figure it out as we go. But what happens when people engage in the community and they study with one another and they get into a group? I'm seeing several small groups that are come and that are participating in this. They grow together because spiritual formation or Christian formation happens best when you're in a community of people and you're doing it together. And the reason for that is not just for accountability, although that's a great reason. It's because we get to see what God's doing in one another's lives. We get to wrestle with some of the questions we have about Scripture and about Christianity. We get to help one another when we're struggling. I like how Pastor Adam often says it's like the stretcher bears, which comes out of Mark chapter 2 when the uh, men, four of them, came carrying their paralyzed friend to see Jesus and what we do is we carry the stretcher for one another. It's not the only thing we do. We also help each other learn, study, and grow. And this, what happens after that process of engaging is eventually what takes place in people's lives is they begin to express who God is to them. Maybe they'll say something to a coworker, even if it's as simple as something as say, well, thanks for sharing me that. I'll pray for you. Or maybe it's an opportunity for you to share your faith with your neighbor or somebody that you are close to or not so close to. And then what happens is we get on this spiritual journey and we move from exploring God to encountering God to engaging in God's community to begin expressing it. And the ultimate goal is that we would embody the person and work of Jesus. The ultimate goal is what we as Wesleyans call Christian perfection. We're called Wesleyans, of course, because John Wesley and John Wesley helped us to understand this doctrine of Christian perfection. And what doc the doctrine of Christian perfection is, in the simplest of ways to say it, is your heart is so full of love, there's not room for anything else. Not just the love for others, how you treat others, but your love, your devotion, your loyalty, your surrender to God. And so we talk about it in terms of loving God and loving others. Last week we explained that, if you were here, as the Jesus Creed. And we talked about the Shema and this idea of loving God and loving others. And eventually what happens in our lives is through the trials and through the tragedies and through the triumphs and celebrations as well, we grow in our faith for the goal of becoming a person that reflects the image of Jesus to all those we're in contact with. And so we talk about born the king, not just because it's Christmas time and it's fun to talk about baby Jesus being born in a cave uh, to a virgin and then Joseph having questions and all of them being confused and all of these, you know, the, the, the king wanting to kill him so they flee and all these things. These are great stories and they're important for us to understand and they're deeply meaningful. But like I said last week, if we don't understand it in the context of the Old Testament narrative that's taking place, it's really hard to, gas to grasp the relevance for our own life as we move forward with these stories. And so our goal over these four weeks is to talk about Jesus as king. Born the King. We're doing that in the sermon series too, right? Adam's, Pastor Adam's sermon series, The King is Born. We're covering totally different passages. I was just talking with him outside there over in the cafe, and he was saying, what are you teaching on tonight? And I was like, what are you preaching on this weekend? We're kind of sharing notes. And uh, it's fun because there's so much content. There's so much to learn and so much to study that, you know, we could talk for weeks and weeks and weeks and not overlap. And I think that's a testament to who God is and how big God is and how we understand the vastness of the truths that is God. And so my goal for you today is not just for you to get more intellectually, uh, to get more information and to be intellectually stimulated. My goal for you 
is that somewhere along the line, your heart will feel what your mind is knowing, right? You, we, we know, we love, and we serve. We, we, we know we are theologically informed. We're spiritually transformed. There's no more, there's, we're so full of love in our heart, there's not room for anything else. And that causes us to be active in the world, to be what we might call missional. And so some of you said, you know, oh, hey, you know, I don't, great class and everything, you know, and I, I wish you would go deeper with this, and I wish you would go deeper with this. And like in our time frame that we have, 75 minutes, my goal is to stimulate your heart so that you might investigate some of these things and discover them, either with your group or on your own. I think it's best when we connect with one another, even though that can be a challenge logistically, finding the time to meet with people that have a regular rhythm. But it's just best, I think. But it's not exclusive to that. And tonight, at the very end, I'm going to share with you some of the things that I do in my life to try to live out the kingdom. And that's what we're going to do tonight, if you just... Bear with me here as we go through this bit of a review. Uh, Advent study this week two, how do we participate in Jesus' kingdom mission? But just to be mindful of the fact that the word Advent comes from this word Adventus, which means coming or arrival. Again, this is all review. Christians at Advent, we prepare our hearts. We don't just learn the story, hear it over again, and we don't just like think about, hey, what's new in this story? We say, what, 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 who am I becoming as a person? Who am I becoming? We prepare our hearts for the coming and the arrival of Jesus, the King. We reflect on the important themes, hope, peace, joy, love. You might remember we did a very, you know, I'll say 50,000 foot view of the entire Bible, the narrative. For those of you who weren't with us last week, it takes about 25 to 30 minutes, maybe a little less if I shared it one-on-one. -on -one. If you've never been through the entire Bible, I would encourage you to do a couple of things. One, Email me, let's find time for coffee, and I'll walk you through it. Two, we have a, a teacher by the name of, uh, I call him doctor, Daryl Holtz. Most people don't know that he has this doctorate. Uh, he's a brilliant guy. He's a theologian. He, as much as he is uh, a pastor and a writer, he's a great guy. And he teaches a class called Meet Your Bible. We don't always offer it because it's eight weeks long and it doesn't always fit into the calendar. But if you have never taken Meet Your Bible or you've never been through the full narrative to fully understand what the Bible is saying, next time you see that class advertised, you need to take that class. It literally will it bring some new thinking, but hopefully some new living and new re purpose and meaning to your life. Daryl's been teaching that for several years now. Hundreds of people have gone through it, and it is well worth your time, even if it's a review for you or a refresher course. The other thing I would tell you as it relates to understanding the full narrative is I would probably say to somebody who has been through Daryl's class or somebody who has been following Jesus a little bit longer in their life, maybe has a little bit more Christian maturity, not necessarily maturity in general, but has a, this ability to uh, recall stories and understand how they fit together. Maybe you grew up in the church. Take what we call Disciple One. We call it one because there's five of them, <laughs> but we really want you to at least take the first one. How many of you, just show of hands, how many of you have taken Disciple One? Okay, I'd say maybe half. Uh, there's, it's fantastic. You'll go deeper than you thought you would. I'm not going to lie to you. It's heavy lifting. You will read, I think they say, about 80%, 85% of the Bible. And that's a lot. And you know what? Sometimes you read the stuff that's not fun to read. <laughs> but the, the benefit is not just the reading. The benefit is like, the piecing together, unlocking this biblical narrative that God has for us so we can best understand what it means for us to be a disciple, an apprentice of Jesus. So if you ever see those two classes, experiences, whatever you want to call them, advertised, and you've always wondered about them, look me up, ask me, I'll tell you more about them, but we really hope that people will at a minimum, say, I'm interested in the 30 to 50,000 foot view. Will you walk me through it? But hopefully, commit to the 24 weeks and say, I want to go through disciple and learn as much as I can about how this Bible all pieced together. I guarantee you, some of it you'll know. Some of it you'll say, I never knew that. I never knew that. Oh, that means this. Wow. So anyway, God's good world begins 
And we are uh, in this being created in the image of God. We've been given this freedom. I'm going to go even faster, right? So this freedom allows us to make decisions. God says, I love you so much, I'm going to give you the ability to choose. And unfortunately, humans choose to usurp God's authority, be the king of their own life, turn from trusting in God to trusting themselves. They allow Satan, evil, to deceive them. And all of a sudden, the world goes from being good to being broken. But we have a God who is compassionate, gracious, merciful, and God, even in so much as seeing the brokenness, says this world will not be broken forever. And so we as humans have been promised that all creation, not just humanity, but all creation will one day be restored. So God makes this problem, promise that through Abraham, Abraham, all things will be made new one day. We see in about 1,500 year span of the Old Testament, we see these kings and these prophets, prophets and, 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 and poets. And you might remember this, the narrative is something like this. Hey, we want a king of our own. And God says, no, I'm your king. No, we want a king of our own. We want a real king. God said, I am the real king. They said, no, we want a king like all the other great nations on the earth have. And God said, fine, here's your king. And more brokenness ensues. Because we all know when humans lead things, and humans are broken, and humans make mistakes, it doesn't always work the way it's intended to work. So God comes finally in the form of Jesus and says, I'm going to have to show these people how to live, I guess, right? So I'm going to go and I'm going to incarnate. I'm going to dwell among them, and I'm going to show them what it means for the kingdom to be near. We're going to talk about a little bit even further than we did last week what that means for us as Christians today. God comes in person, and he comes to us in these ministry and this mission as prophet, priest, and king, and he helps us to understand that the mission of Jesus is to die for us, yes, that we might be delivered from our sinfulness, but that we might have a framework to live in such a way that reflects the life of Christ, that we might bring honor and glory to God, and in doing so, reveal the kingdom of God. And God faces the worst for us. God is crucified. Jesus is crucified. He's buried and he's risen. We know this, Church of the Resurrection. And we celebrate this res resurrection. We don't just celebrate it once a year. Actually, we're called to practice resurrection. That means to live in hope every day with a confident expectation that God is who God says God is. And we believe that. We choose every day to wake up and say, I believe that God is who God says God is, that God to this day still is active in our world through us as modeled by Jesus so that one day we might move to this very last box you see up there, a good world that's restored. God's mission is to restore the world towards its intended wholeness. God is using you and me to do that. And somebody asked me last week, well, then why is there so much brokenness in the world? And this is a conversation I have constantly with people. If God really wants to do this, isn't God so powerful to do this? Well, these are great questions, and they're very important questions. I will just tell you that God's answer for that is us, Christians, the church, not just a new society of people, but the church is the image in which God says, look, you want to understand me, look at Jesus. And Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit to guide the church, us, to take this message into the world. And so every day that I choose to live, I choose to live. I try to do it the best I can. I don't always do it perfectly. Of course not. I've got a lot of room to grow. But I'm trying to live God's will. And God's will for me is to participate in God's mission to restore the world towards its intended wholeness. That everything I do in my life must point to the advance of God's reign, not Chris's reign. And this is the fundamental issue with humanity, right? It's like Adam and Eve decided that they would put their trust in themselves. And it's so easy for us to trust ourselves. But really, we're called to surrender ourselves. To God's mission. And Jesus himself said, I'm not here for me. This isn't my mission. This is God's mission. God sent me. So God has sent me. So I send you into the world. And then we zoomed in quite, you know, we took, we took a look at some of these things, these 13 different scenes from the life of Christ, which I always find helpful to see various images that help me think through these. And we see Jesus doing miracles, Jesus teaching. One of Jesus' most famous teachings we're going to talk about here tonight 
We talked about prophet, priest, and king a little bit earlier, but this prophet is Jesus with this message, this priestly ministry that he has to heal and to teach and to call people to a new way of life. And then obviously as king, it's Jesus' mission and he reigns. We talked about different aspects of the kingdom. Maybe the best way we can understand the kingdom as it relates to our life and living it and surrendering it to us is the oldest, simplest, and probably the shortest creed, which is Jesus is Lord. And I showed you these six aspects of the nature of Jesus' kingdom from my friend Scott McKnight's book. And that's what we covered. We covered a lot of that material. And tonight we're going to cover a lot more material. We're going to talk about how first century hearers most likely would have understood the kingdom of God. We're going to talk to Mark, about the marks of God's reign, right? What, how do we identify it? When do we see it? What does it look like? We're going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount and specifics. And we're going to look at it and say, what does that have to do with the kingdom? And what does that have to do with our lives? And then when we talked a little bit about this, and some of you had questions about it after class last week, so I wanted to touch on it again. What, is it, what are we actually praying when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done? Which is something we pray if you gather with us on worship. You know we pray this every single time we gather as Christians and worship at Church of the Resurrection. And then I'm going to share some practical ways to live out the kingdom of God today. Sound good? You ready to move? All right. You have black books on your table. It's the attendance notebook. Most of you know the drill by now. If you do... Uh, you have somebody who's sitting there that doesn't, please help them understand. Just write your name in there. Keep attendance for us. We love to know when pe new people come. Uh, we're not uh, keeping like track of you. We're not you know, spying on you or anything like that. We just like to try to keep track so we can best steward and serve you on these nights. At the very end, after you have uh, you know, enjoy, hopefully enjoyed the class or at least spent your time in the class, somebody from your table take the book to the back. That really helps our staff out. So can you do that for me? So even as I'm talking right now, just fill it out. Pass it around. And just like we say in church, if you worship with us, you know we say what? Pass it back. If you don't already know the people sitting at your table, that would be a great way to know, learn their name and match the name with who's sitting there and then later be able to recognize them by name. Say, hey, Bob, it's really nice to know you or whatever the case may be. All right? You with me? We're going to fill it out? You promise? All right. <laughs> All right. So mo last week I uh, took some thoughts from my friend Scott McKnight's book. Tonight I'm taking some thoughts from what's called Kingdom Ethics, Following Jesus in Contemporary Context. This is about 900 pages, a great book. I, don't re I haven't read it straight through, but I've used it as a reference resource. I always want to give you the uh, uh, sources that I use, A, because maybe it's a way to stimulate and use some thinking, and you, maybe you'll dig into it yourselves, but also because not all this material is mine, right? There's nothing new under the sun. I'm just trying to figure out the best ways to articulate it to you. I think... Some of you in this room could do what I'm doing right now. You learn enough by reading and studying and researching that you could stand up and you could present for 75 minutes on the kingdom of God. If you did that, you would need resources like this, like I do. Someone once said, how do you know all this stuff? I really don't, okay? I read and I try to remember it. Some things I remember, some things I don't. And my goal here is to say, read, grow, stretch yourself. I'll talk more about that towards the very end. Okay. How first century hearers understood the kingdom of God? Some of you may already know some about this. Some of you may be hearing this for the first time. I was reminded of this as I was reading through doing some research for tonight. Since ba the Babylonian captivity, about 700 or so B.C., the Hebrew language was assimilated with Aramaic. In other words, people came, took the Israelites out of their country, made them live with them, and they assimilated. And assimilating, what happened was they began to take on a new language. The Hebrew language become uh, less and less over time. It was used less and less. And so what happened when they would gather in the synagogues, bullet point number two, is there was an interpreter. And the interpreter, called a meturgeman, if I'm saying that correctly, again, I know just enough to be dangerous here, right? would help Hebrew people understand the, Amer uh, sorry, the Aramaic by paraphrasing the Hebrew into modern-day vernacular. Maybe the best example we have of this in modern day is what we call the message. Have you ever seen Eugene Peterson's The Message? Right? It's not a translation of the Bible. It's actually a paraphrasing of the Bible. And what Eugene Peterson has done is taken the entire Bible and, and taking the original manuscripts and those who have worked on the original manuscripts and some of the resources related to the original manuscripts and all that comes with that and paraphrased it to make it easy to understand. And so what would happen was in the synagogue, they would read from the Hebrew original manuscripts and people were like, I don't get it. I don't speak Hebrew. 
And somebody would have to translate it for him. And the maturgeman would be the one who would translate it for him into the modern-day vernacular. And in about the 4th century, the Targum was put together. Now, the Targum is a, 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 doc, a series of documents that collects some of these paraphrases of original Hebrew writings. And it was basically a way for them to sort of put it all into one place. And there's lots like there is on any other thing. Lots of scholars think lots of different things about these. Some people say, no, 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 that's not how it went. Some people say, well, it definitely went this way. Look, I'm not here to make a stand on that. I'm just here to tell you that the paraphrasing was really important and that beyond its importance, it was necessary for people to understand who this Jesus was and why and how and where these old texts, many of which Jesus would quote from, we're talking about the kingdom of God. And so what would happen are things like this. Like this. There. They would say instead of the kingdom of God is near, or the kingdom of God is at hand, or the kingdom of God is within you, or the kingdom is like, and all these different parables and such, that we have all these different ways of understanding the kingdom, they would paraphrase it like this. The kingdom of, of God is being revealed. Jesus is revealing this kingdom. And Isaiah 53.10 was often paraphrased as the kingdom of the Messiah, meaning Jesus' kingdom. Now, many of the first century folks didn't really understand this. In fact, we know from Luke chapter 4, I mentioned this last week, that when Jesus is in the synagogue and he's reading from the scroll, likely in Hebrew, although maybe in Aramaic, we don't know, there was probably an interpreter there helping people understand. But Jesus' bold statement in Luke chapter 4 is that, yes, the kingdom is of the Messiah, and I am the kingdom. That is me. I'm the Messiah. I'm the king. And so you say, well, so what does this have to do with anything? Well, take a look. First century hearers would have understood the kingdom of God is being revealed, or I think better said this way, disclosed before our very eyes. Sometimes around church world, we ask each other this question. Maybe you've heard it before. The question is, where did you see God at work in the world today? Has anybody ever asked you that, or you ever a dialogue about that? Well, you're going to hear in about 30 seconds, Okay. But what happens is there's an inbreaking, and right before our very eyes, we're seeing kingdom activity. We're seeing that there is this kingdom, there is this truth, there is this Jesus that spoke this truth about this kingdom, and when we live it out every day, it, we're disclosing the fact that it's real. This is why when we say Jesus is Lord and we actually live it as Jesus is Lord, it causes people to say, wow. I mean, even Pilate, if you remember this conversation, Pilate you know, and Jesus are having a conversation at his trial, and he knows where Jesus is from. He says, Jesus says right before that, from Nazareth. And then Pilate says, yeah, but who are you? Where are you from? You're not from this world. Like he's so blown away in this moment of transcendence that even Pilate suggests, who are you? There's other places in Scripture where this takes place, but where God is disclosed in the person of Jesus right before the very eyes. It's God's self-revelation in this dynamic reign. And dynamic is a really important word here because it's active and it's happening. And every single time that we participate in it, there's this inbreaking of the kingdom. That's why Jesus can say the kingdom is within you because when we live it, it is exposed out of our actions and therefore seen by the world around us. This is the call of the church, right? This is why I can say that the call on my life is to participate in God's mission to restore the world towards its intended wholeness. Because my job is to reveal this kingdom by my actions, by the words I speak, right? by, by the tone I take with people when I'm annoyed with them even. All of that, right? So... Let's pause for about four to five minutes and let's have you talk at your table and answer that question. Where have you seen God at work in the world today? Maybe phrased differently, where have you seen the inbreaking of the kingdom today?
What, have, what, what did you see? What caught your attention? What did you observe? Or what were you a part of where you say, God was at work in the world when? Or I saw God at work in the world in this way. Go ahead and pause. I'll, uh, we'll put the timer on for four, probably four and a half minutes or so. We'll give you a chance to chat. Not everybody always gets a chance to talk. We'll have other time to talk. And like I always say, there's some people who don't like to talk. You don't have to. There's some people who really like to talk. Tell them to stop. Right? Give somebody else a chance. Right? Maybe have a signal like tap on the table when they've been talking too long or something. Right? We're all, we all, it's okay, we are who we are, but let's give each other a chance to have a chance. Where did you see God at work in the world today? Go. All right, good job. I'm sure the discussions were great at your table. I think it's important for us to just remind ourselves every now and again that when we take time and reflect upon where we saw God at work in the world, it is a reminder to us that God's reign is dynamic, that it's happening, it's taking place. Uh, you can watch the news, you can read the tweets that come across and the Facebook posts, and you can be, if you want, as the prophet Isaiah <laughs> tells the people of Israel, you can be all gloom and doom, and you can let that overtake you, as Isaiah speaks about here in chapter 8 of Isaiah. You can do that. That's easy. Dark is easy. But living in the light and living in this awareness that, yes, in the midst of brokenness, there is this call to wholeness. And it does happen. And when we recognize it, it's an honor to God for us to stop and say, wow, God, look what you're doing. And it happens in all kinds of different ways. I saw it today. I was uh, at a, having lunch, and I was waiting for my appointment to show up. And I'm sitting at Nick and Jake's just in the seating area there. Uh, waiting as, and uh, I see this gentleman who's walking in the door and he's struggling to get into the door. He has his walker and he has a bag over his shoulder and he's really having a hard time. And uh, the, right as I noticed him, the uh, I don't know what you call him, the dude behind the desk that's going to give you my table. What's the name for that? I forget. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, he asked me a question because I eat there all the time and he wants to talk to me. So I asked me a question and I turned to respond. And as I turned to respond, in my mind, I'm like, what's going to happen to this guy struggling to get to the door? So I watched this guy get up, walk to the door, hold the door, take the man's bag from him, take the walker so he can actually fit it through the door, double doors, right? They don't always make it nice and wide for people. <laughs> Amen, somebody said. And so he, he, this guy just helps him. And I'm sitting there having this conversation, but watching this out of this other eye, and I'm like, that's amazing. I love that. It's the simple things. And it's, you know, some might say the little things, but if I, as I'm often reminded and as I often remind you, there are no little things in life, just specific things. And this was a specific way for another human being to care for a human being. And it was beautiful. I don't know the guy. I don't know the guy with the walker and the bag. I just thought to myself, that's kingdom activity. That's a story I can tell tonight and fill two minutes. That's what I really thought. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. But I thought to myself, wow. So anyway, I sit back down. The guy gets, and I think at this point, this guy's helping him so much, I think he's with him. I think he's waiting on him. But he takes and he walks the man all the way to his table, comes back and sits down and goes back to what he was doing. I'm like, would I do that? I'd like to think I would do that. But would I really do that? And what if I was busy? Would I do it when I was busy? I hope I would. Yeah. I mean, it was a moment. There's all kinds of moments like that. And you say, well, really, that, what's that have to do with the kingdom? Is that's, that's the way the world is supposed to work. That's love. That's caring. Okay. Jesus would often quote from Isaiah and from the Psalms and other places when he would speak about the kingdom of God. There's some very, very, you know, like tight matches. And then there's some more implicit or implied things that when we can match up. But there's three passages in particular 
that I want us to look at tonight. The first one I'm going to read to you and share, you, share with you some marks. Uh, and then the second one, because now we're moving into the marks of the kingdom. And then I'm going to have us go back to our tables and discuss Isaiah chapter 60, 17 through 19. And then we'll look at Isaiah 35. Okay. I uh, can't see that very well because of the way I laid it out. So I'm going to shift my body here just a little bit, and I'm going to read it. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Of those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Have you ever heard that in the New Testament? That's in Matthew chapter 4. This is a tight match between the scriptures as the prophet uh, told the people of Israel, and it was recorded much later than the maturge men, right, would interpret it for the people. Well, Jesus flat out see this, says it, hey, people were walking in, they saw, in darkness and they saw a great light. It goes on to say, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice in the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Do you ever see this in the New Testament? Of course you have. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The passion of the Lord will accomplish this. The commitment of the Lord will accomplish this. And when you read passages like this that Jesus would have quoted to as he was walking around the countryside, you understand a little bit more, okay, what does this kingdom look like? What are the marks of this kingdom? And that's what we get into when we look at this. Now you can read that passage and really break it down, and you can find at least these, this many. I don't know how many that is. One, two, three, four, five, six. It looks like light. God's presence is with you. You have seen a great light. You have discovered God. God is with you. He's present among you. Joy and rejoice. This is an exalting and a praising. The deliverance. You break the hold of my oppressors. This peace, this, unres this resolved conflict, right? Where these nations are battling and they're at war, but this Jesus comes and says, look, this is what peace looks like. And displays it. Justice, righting the wrongs. We talked about this last week, righting the wrongs of the world. This is maybe just distilled down to its, the, the very core of what it is. This is justice, righting the wrongs of the world. Sometimes we disagree on the wrongs, but we know that we ought to right what we see that's wrong. And then righteousness, this upright, this blamelessness. Just in this one passage, we see these six marks of God's kingdom. And we start to see not just through Jesus' teaching, but the prophet Isaiah telling the people, there is going to come a day where this guy comes and he's going to be teaching stuff like this. And he's going to show it to us. And Jesus would point back to it and say, yes, that's true. That's me. I'm bringing the kingdom. Remember last week we talked about the kingdom being already but not yet? Right? It's, it's like being on a swing, right? You're like back and forth. That you're already but you're not yet. The, Jesus came and inaugurated this kingdom. And one day all things will be made new. The world will be restored to its intended wholeness. But until that day we live in that space, hopefully doing these things. Do you know people that they, it's like, and I don't want to be mean here or anything, but do you ever know somebody that it's like, they just seem like they don't like life? And you're like, bro, like, where's the joy? Is there anything that's worth celebrating in your life? And some people go through some really hard times, and I get it. I have a friend right now walking through some serious illness, and he doesn't even want to look up. He's like, it's coming to an end. I don't know what to do. How am I going to care for my kids? I don't have enough money saved up for when I'm gone. You know, all of these tough things. You know, that's, that's, that's challenging and that's hard. But what I'm talking referring to are the people who just can't seem to be anything but like grumpy all the time. It's like, where's the joy? Sometimes we muster up a few smiles this time of year because it's Christmas. But I mean, 
Now, there's not so much Christmas shopping that's done in the stores anymore. So, like, I see fewer and fewer fights than I used to see. Uh, especially, like, remember sometimes they post the videos, and it still happens. You see people fighting over, like, Tickle, El- Tickle Me Elmo or whatever that was called. You know, you, t- you see people, like, literally slugging each other, and you're like, really? And then you just see the people that are mad at you. So my son works at Target, and uh, last week, I, after I left here, I finished up, went over there, got done in the office, and went and picked him up at 945. Well, we needed milk and cereal. That's all we eat when my wife is out of town, and she was out of town. So we needed milk and cereal. So I go in the store, and I literally see this guy take his cart and jam it into somebody else's cart because they weren't moving fast enough. I'm just like, before I judge that, I've done that before. (laughs) I mean, not as hard maybe as this guy did it, but I've been like, come on, move, you know? It's like uh, when you're standing in line and, you know, the, the people are talking, they're not paying attention, and the line, the gap gets longer and longer and longer, and you want to say, hey, man, turn around, there's somebody there. Uh, usually what, what I do is, is I just kind of take a step and look like that, you know, and they always go, oh, yeah, come on, let's get up. This guy was having none of that. He was just like, my cart in the back of your car right now. And I'm like, how does it get to this? Now, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to say I'm above that and I've never done things like that. But I'm just trying to say, like, when that moment happens in our lives, like, we ought to reflect and be like, that's not kingdom work. That's not kingdom activity. That's our own doing. That's the exact opposite of what Jesus calls us to be and do. You're going to do it, things like that. I hope you never jam somebody's cart full force. But if you were to do, hopefully you would apologize. Or at least pretend you didn't do it on purpose, right? I mean, come on. So you can look at these passages, and, there's, and, and by the way, the first part of Isaiah is, you know, about first 40-some chapters, and I don't remember exactly, 49, 48, somewhere in there. The first 40-some chapters are, are dealing with the Israelites still in captivity, and then the rest of Isaiah is dealing with uh, how to live after captivity. And so what we have here in Isaiah chapter 9 is they're still in captivity, and they're waiting for this light. They're waiting for this Messiah. This is why it was such a big deal that Jesus, and by the way, Jesus wasn't the only one that went around and called himself the Messiah. He was the only one who, you know, rose from the dead. But people were looking for the Messiah. If you want 15 minutes of fame in the first century, you walk around going, hey, man, I'm the Messiah. You better be ready to be killed for it. But this is what happens when we look at Jesus saying, hey, I am the king. I'm the king. This is the kingdom is here. It's me. And so the Israelites are understanding that one day this is going to happen. And so you can understand the angst and the anticipation and the waiting, the adventing that the people are doing, waiting for Jesus to arrive. You can also then, right, understand the dismay when they find out this Jesus, this king is from Nazareth, a nothing place, born in a stable. What? That's the beauty of it. That's the upside-down kingdom that it is. Now, here's another passage, and hopefully, were you able to see that on the screen okay? Okay, so why don't you take a few minutes again. I'm going to give you, let's do five minutes this time. If you're still in the back, James, and you can set the timer, great. Oh, I see it now. Okay, great. Um, Go ahead and take five minutes. Read through this, and then you identify the marks of the kingdom that you see in this. Right? Now, this one's a little trickier because they're not as explicit. I saved the easy one for me. The hard one for you guys, right? So read through this, and then maybe just someone take a piece of paper out or take your phone out and jot down what, where, what are the, uh, the marks that you see that represent the kingdom of God in this passage. Ready to do that? Ready, set, go. Okay, nice and loud because it's a long distance, but, and I want to be able to repeat it on to the, for those who are watching online and for those who watch this later on video. Uh, so what, what were some of the marks that you discovered in that passage, just those few verses there? Okay, strength, peace, pretty blatant one there right out in front of us, good. Praise, yep. Hope. Hope is embedded in there all the way through for sure. Because you got to remember where we are. I mean, what we're doing is this is Isaiah taking the message that God is giving Isaiah. And on behalf of God, as God's spokesperson, telling the Israelites. So 
uh, where, when it says, instead of bronze, I will bring you. This isn't Isaiah bringing it. This is God bringing it. This is God saying to the people, hey, there's going to be a new day. A new day is going to dawn. Wait for it. Right? And so we have things like strength and hope and peace and praise and what else? Salvation. Deliverance. Okay, now this is a people group here in Isaiah that is like just discovering that what it means to go to, 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 to be in exile and then to finally be released back to the land. But their history of one is, is one of deliverance of away from the slaves, uh, as slaves, away from the masters and all these different aspects of the, of the Israelites' life. So they understand deliverance, but Jesus here is a whole different kind of deliverance that they know nothing about yet. This is part of the beauty of the New Testament and when, the, when the Jesus talks about the Old Testament laws not being done away with or made irrelevant, but instead being fulfilled in Jesus, right? This is a way for us to understand that what the Jewish people in Israel uh, during the time of Jesus would have been thinking. Wow, yes, all of these different aspects, salvation, deliverance. And Jesus was saying, you're not just being like, you know, saved from your oppressor. You're being saved from your sin. And so I don't know if you noticed this, but I will make peace. We already mentioned that one. Your governor. Peace will rule. Peace will be in charge, right? Jesus will be in charge. Jesus is peace. Jesus is the governor. And well-being. Did you catch this? And well-being will be your ruler. Well, what is well-being? A little bit of joy probably in there. Well-being, in this, uh, as we understand this, and one of the unique things about this is the New International Version. I, I, I like the New International Version. I like the contemporary, uh, or the Common English Bible, excuse me. And so uh, there's all kinds of different translations where you can kind of see this even brighter, if you will. But well-being here is holiness, righteousness. And holiness and righteousness, devoutness, loyal to me, Jesus is Lord, will be your ruler. So when we read passages of Scripture like this, whether it's in Bible study or this week, I know you're going to be hearing from Isaiah chapter 7. I, like I said, I was talking with Pastor Adam earlier, and he was telling me about how he's going to be reading from this and talking about different aspects of it. Listen for these marks. And his point in preaching this sermon series is different than what I'm accomplishing here. However, it's very similar. It's like the uh, track, the railroad track, right? They run by side one another. And the reality is, at some point out there, way in the future, in the, if you look far enough, they come together. And this is what happens when we devote ourselves to study and to learning and to listening. So this weekend, what I want you to do in all of the passages is look, oh, there's a mark of the kingdom. There's a mark of the kingdom. There's a mark of the kingdom. There's another passage here that I was going to have us go through in Isaiah chapter 35, but I'm going to skip this one just for time's sake. Again, these exercises you can do on your own. Somebody asked me, maybe it was, I think it might have been last week, maybe it was the last class I taught, I don't remember. Somebody once asked me, like, how do I understand the Bible? Because I read it and I don't get it, especially passages like this. Well, that's why, A, we want you to take a class like Meet Your Bible or Disciple, but I would also tell you that sometimes the best investment you can make is in a study Bible. And a study Bible is reading the Scripture, looking down below, and saying, what is this Scripture talking about? And sometimes it helps to even get a commentary to read alongside of your Bible. It's up to you. Okay. There's some marks for us. There's Isaiah 35. He, oh, you know what? Just briefly, I will talk about the marks because... The marks from that passage, Mark and Isaiah 35, even though we're not going to read it together, healing, holiness, well-being, and joy and gladness. These are marks of the kingdom. And so where did you see God at work in the world today? You know, where is your you know, level of joy and gladness? How's your holiness? Next week, we're going to discuss, okay, if Jesus is the king and the creed is Jesus is Lord, then how do we do that with our lives? How do we live holy lives? How do we, as I've always said, my theology professor in seminary used to say this, how do I increase the frequency and the duration of the holy moments in my life? How often and for how long can I live a holy life? Not just to be holy, but to reflect this beautiful image of Christ so that others around me can discover it and embrace it. So let's move now to a specific 
set of passages that we have both in Matthew and in Luke. We're going to talk about Matthew. I just put this up for reference sake. I'm not going to talk about all these. We'd be here all night long. We have just over 15 minutes left. Sermon on the Mount. How many of you have studied the Sermon on the Mount or at least read it or at least could say, here it is in my Bible, you know where it is? Okay, we probably need to do better. Not going to lie, all right? And that's why we're doing these classes like this because we want people to be able to go, oh, I know where that is. I know what it's talking about. The Sermon on the Mount is not just the Beatitudes. People often refer to the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes as the same thing. Beatitudes are inside the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, you might say Matthew chapter 5 through 7. This I just ripped from the uh, Google search. You could do that too pretty easily. And it's just an image, a screenshot, and it covers from Matthew 5 all the way to Matthew 7 and the different topics that Jesus is talking about. Everything from salt and light to lust and adultery, eye for an eye. You've heard us probably someone quote that. Love for your enemy, treasure in heaven, how to fast, uh, how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, right? That's part of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, ask, seek, knock, the narrow gate, false prophets, the wise builder. You've probably heard these stories, read these stories. I'm sure you've heard them preached on over the course of your lifetime. Maybe not all of them, but pieces of them. The Sermon on the Mount is helpful for us in understanding the kingdom, especially as it relates to these Beatitudes. Because what Jesus is doing on the Sermon on the Mount, what he's doing is he's teaching people, here's what the kingdom looks like. When we do these things, people can recognize the kingdom of God. And when they recognize the kingdom of God, They understand that God is delivering them from themselves, their own sinfulness, and there is a new future for them, a new kind of people, the church that's coming together to be the spokesperson, the prophets, if you will, for modern days so that the world might know who Jesus is. One of my favorite passages in all of the scripture is John chapter 17. It's referred to as the high priestly prayer, because Jesus is praying right before his crucifixion, and he prays, and he's praying, and he prays for three things. The first thing he does is he prays for himself, which kind of sounds arrogant until you understand the Scripture. The Scripture is actually saying, I pray that I would honor you with what we're about to do. He prays for his disciples, his closest friends, and then he prays for who? Us. The world, Christians. He prays for himself. He prays for his closest friends, the disciples. He loves them so much. He cares about them. He wants them to show love for one another. And and I can't remember how many times. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say nine. I'm probably wrong, but I think it's nine. Nine times in just that one passage in John chapter 17, depending on your translation. So don't, like, you know, come to me that I was wrong until you read all the translations, every single one of them, okay? And nine times the phrase is, so that... And it's like this, do this or live this way so that the world might know. Do this so that the world might know. Live this way so that the world might know. The whole point is that we are on mission. The so that is that we live our life so that the world might know. That's John chapter 17. It's not the Beatitudes. But I don't even know how I got on that other than to say it's important for us to understand this pattern for living our lives. And Jesus frames it, quoting again from Isaiah, frames it for us in what we refer to as the Beatitudes. We don't have time to read every single one of these. I would love for you to, if you haven't already, take a snapshot of it. You can find it in your own scripture. I mean, it's Matthew and it's... um, pretty easy to get to, and read through it, it's our job to make sense of it and to make meaning for our lives every day, and which we're going to do here in just a minute. But the beatitude, is beatitude means blessing. And we're blessed because we are experiencing God's reign in our midst. And when these things happen that Jesus talks about, that's God's reign. The joy or blessedness of the good news of participation in God's gracious deliverance. This is what Beatitudes means. Each Beatitude ends by pointing to the reality of God's reign. Again, already but not yet kingdom. And so when we understand these Beatitudes, it looks like this. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does that mean? Blessed is the people who participate in the advance or the revealing of God's reign are humble people before God and identify with the humble, the poor, and the outcasts. It reminds me of the time, I forget uh, who said it, but I was reading through this, this book. Uh, I think it was a book about Mother Teresa, and, and she was quoting somebody else that once said, uh, oh, yeah, you like to hang out with poor people? What are their names? And it was impressed upon me, and I'll never forget that. It was because, like, where's my life in relationship to serving those who are poor outcasts? I mean, we all know these people who society pushes down, makes feel small, picks on, bullies. One of the questions uh, that I ask my kids a lot, my, my two boys in the, still live in the house, my daughter, she's down at UMKC, I don't get to see her as much, but one of the questions we always have asked Megan and Drew and Luke is um, about bullying. Like, did you bully anybody today? And because sometimes we think that's pushing down, or back in my day, that was like stealing lunch money. But bullying is any time we make somebody feel small for whatever the reason. And we use our power or our authority or our influence or our status. And it doesn't just happen with kids in high school and middle school. And so when we look at this and we say, hey, I want to live a different way. I want to live the way Jesus prescribed. Then we got to figure out, well, then how do I identify with the humble and the poor? And then blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I'm sure you've heard these before. They're read often. They're spoken about. They're taught on. Mourn, people who, who participate in the advance of the revealing of God's name mourn with sincere repentance towards God and comfort with those who mourn. They join them. They first look at their own life and repent, and then they join them in their mourning, and they comfort them. There's this uh, technique, if you will, this method called place sharing, P-L-A-C-E, place sharing. And place sharing is really all about just being with somebody. And sometimes, right, we don't even need to open our mouth to say anything. When somebody is struggling through something, just your presence is enough. Have you ever been in that situation? Or you've had somebody with you? I got some bad, tragic news. I'm not going to share what it was when I was 28 years old. And I remember my wife, Gina. Some of you know her, have met her. She just sat with me for hours. As I sobbed, she didn't even have to say a word. Just her presence was enough. She shared the place I was in with me. Too early to make sense of it. Maybe the best thing to do is just to stop, pause, and share somebody's place. How can we do that with people? right? And then here's another one. A surrender to God, committing themselves to following God's way and making peace. Following God's way is one of holiness, <laughs> right? It's one of devout uh, life. It's commitment. It's loyalty. It's Jesus is Lord. Uh, seven, verse 7, blessed are the last one on there. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Uh, those who advance or reveal God's reign practice compassion and action towards those in need. These all kind of overlap. They kind of go together. And in some cases, they, they, they mean something entirely different to your life than they do my life because our circumstances and situations are different. And what's required of me uh, uh, in my neighborhood might be, re might be something totally different than what's required of you and your neighborhood or your workplace. It's the idea of that compassion and action is this message to the world so that the world might know what? That God has not forgotten them. I can't tell you how many people today who question God and God's existence that I dialogue with, sometimes teenagers, sometimes people in their 20s and 30s, sometimes people my age, just peers of mine saying, yeah, I've never really been able to believe that stuff. And here's why. Because I've always felt God was distant. I always felt God was somewhere, if there was a God, how would I ever get to know God? Where would I ever see God? And you know the answer to that is in our lives. The way we live our life is a representation 
of the way Christ lived his life. The scripture tells us over and over again in various places, if you want to know who God is, you study Jesus, his son, the express representation of God. And when we live that way, powered by the Holy Spirit, I might add, it reveals the nature of God. And people start believing it. You know, I think the future of the church is not just in standing around talking about God. It's in communities of people who are living in such a way that the world looks on and goes, they're different. And I mean different in a good way, by the way. But they're, you, they're different. Something about them. When I needed help, they were there. When I needed prayer, they were the first ones praying for me. When I needed a, a pat on the back, I got one. When I needed a high five, I got one. When I needed someone to speak the truth into my life, I got it. Here's a couple more Beatitudes. Uh, let's take nine. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. You know, those who advance the kingdom make peace with their enemies, as God shows love to God's enemies. So this is a long story. I don't have time to go into it all. A few years ago, I got a phone call, and I didn't recognize it because I don't usually answer my phone if it's not somebody that I know. I let it go to voicemail, and I, maybe you're in that practice too, but I get a lot of phone calls like you get a lot of phone calls, and half the time anymore, it's like spam anyways, robocalls, so I just let it go. And strangest thing was, it was this guy that I knew from like 20 years ago. And let's just say we didn't get along real well. And he called me up, and he left a message. He said, hey, will you call me back? And I thought, why would I ever want to call this clown back? I mean, I still have that feeling of like, man, forget you. I've had to overcome that. Well, I let a week go by, see if he'd call back again. He did. <laughs> we had a conversation, and he said, listen, man, I've been harboring bitterness towards you for 20 years, and it's got to end today. What do I need to do to get your forgiveness? And I was embarrassed that I hadn't already given him my forgiveness, quite honestly, because it was over some stupid thing. I'm so embarrassed to tell you what it was even over. But sometimes we let those things fester and they build and they build and they build. The enemies just isn't the people that, you know, you're going to go to war against. The enemies are the people who you're in conflict with. They are unwilling to, like, you know, make peace with. And, and those who live out the kingdom, they... Give and accept forgiveness. They make peace. And we continue on. Blessed are you when people insult you. That's not fun. Persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil. Now that means something for us than it did for first, Christ, first century Christians. You know, if, if, if you're the Apostle Paul and you're wandering around, people were persecuting you. They're whipping you. They're spitting on you. They're beating you. They're throwing you in jail. They suffer. They enter into the suffering the same as the life of Christ. I'm writing a new book called The Wesley Prayer Challenge, and it's about Wesley's covenant prayer. If you've ever seen, I don't have time to get into it now, but one of the phrases is, put me to suffering. We're laying ourselves out before God and we're saying, do this, do that, put me to this, put me to that. And one of the phrases is, put me to suffering. Let me enter into sacrifice and service for you. Now, Jesus didn't have you know, any place to call home. Did you know that? I mean, I'm not telling you pack up, go live on the streets, but here's the deal. There are some things that we can do to suffer with Jesus that reveal and live into this kingdom activity to advance God's reign. Somebody once came to Jesus and said, hey, I'll follow you wherever you go. Yeah, big words. And Jesus said, what? Foxes have holes. Birds have nests. But the Son of Man, meaning himself, Jesus, has no place to lay his head. If you're going to follow me, it's not going to be pretty. It's going to take everything you got. And sometimes it's a challenging, and sometimes it's hard, and sometimes there's great celebrations that come with it. But when we look at the Beatitudes as a framework, we say, wow, how am I supposed to live this kingdom life every day in my workplace, in my neighborhood, where I study and go to school, whatever it is? This is a great framework for us. So that when we do pray the prayer, and we say, thy kingdom come, we pray for the world to be made whole. When you say the Lord's Prayer 
In fact, I, you've heard me say this before. Some of you have heard my classes, and I think it's so helpful to be reminded of. The St. Teresa of Avila once said that every single time you say the Lord's Prayer, what you're really saying is, please use me to make it happen. Right? We're the conduit for it. And so when we pray, thy kingdom come. So this weekend, when you're in worship, and we pray the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and you'll see the next bullet. Thy will be done. What you're doing is, thy, thy kingdom come is, may the world be as you intended for it to be. To pray the kingdom is to believe that God's work and mission will be done at some point in the future. It, to pray it and to believe it, that we might experience this work of God's salvation today. And thy will be done on earth as it in heaven means we're turning ourselves over, turning our own interests, turning our own desires, and we're saying, here I am. Your will be done, not mine. Okay, so four minutes, now just three minutes left. Here's my challenge for you leaving this place today. I want you to uh, consider how you are going to live this stuff out. Next week, we're going to talk about the, uh, a theology of love, and we're going to talk about holiness, and we're going to talk about Christian perfection, and we're going to talk about what it means to, and how to be devout. I'm going to talk about spiritual disciplines. We're going to have all kinds of fun. But sometime between now and then, I want you to grab a piece of paper, put five columns, and I want you to write worship, study, serve, give, and share at the top. Now, some of you are familiar with this language because here we talk about the five essential Christian practices. The five essential practices of the Christian faith. Our senior pastor's book just came out called The Walk. This Lent, we'll be going through it together. I'll be teaching classes from his book, The Walk. Maybe he'll even join us if I can get him here. I know he loves to be here when his schedule allows. But I would like you to think about, okay, if I'm going to live out the Christian life, how do I do that? Here's five areas for us to think about it. With my worship, with my study habits, with where I serve, my giving, and my sharing. I put some of what I think maybe most people might be looking to do and some of my own stuff up there. Um, you know, here's, I'm going to end this by saying, um, a few years ago, you know what I learned is that I like money. And uh, I'm an entrepreneur. Some people don't know this about me, but I have several businesses that I have always running. It's part of who I am. I can't not do it. I can't help myself. So in addition to what I'm doing, I'm always creating something. I'm writing a book. I'm developing a project. Right now I'm working on a mobile application. I'm doing all kinds of fun stuff. But a few years ago, I had to wonder, why am I doing this? What is it about this? Why am I driven to do this? And I've, it came to the ugly realization that I like money. And then what I had to do was, I had to say, how can I use my strengths, my gifts, my talents, but align these things for my purpose in life, your will, God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in order that I might align them with God's purposes. And so I've had to battle this idea of wealth accumulation and uh, you know, at one time, my, I, 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 grew, I didn't grow up with any money, and I think that stems from it. I got all kinds of problems. That's probably just one of the little ones in my life, okay? But I always thought, I'm not going to be in a case where I can't pay the heat or I can't put food on the table. And so I've probably worked harder and gone above and beyond to make sure that never happens. And in doing so, I was consumed by that. And when you're consumed by that and it takes over your life, pretty soon it runs your life. But through some disciplines and through some practices and some Christian practices, I'm not going to say I'm over it. I continue to battle with it, but I've learned how to give. You see the under the give with the very last one, these micro loans. Have you ever done this? This is fascinating. Micro loans. You give $400, $500, $600 to somebody on the other side of the world because they need to sell shoes. 
just enough to get through the Christmas season, just enough inventory that their small business can run. And so my wife and I, we love to sit down at the computer, and, I, and I'm not here to advertise for a certain website, so I'm not going to tell you which one, but we choose somebody that we love. This is a great story. And we match up a few hundred dollars with somebody, and on, they, 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 it's a 96% payback rate. So really I'm not even doing charity. I'm just giving a little micro loan. But I have this little stash of cash, and I'm constantly giving out these microloans. And you know what I found is that when I'm generating income in order that I can give it away and help others in need, whether it's here at my church and my tithe or whether it's just being charitable to other people, it reminds me of what this is all about in the first place, not about accumulating money. It's about using my strengths to reveal and to advance God's kingdom. That's one of the areas where I'm growing in. You would have to fill it out for yourself. Next week when you come, I want you to bring it with you. I'm going to sit down with each of you individually, and we're going to go. No, we're not. <laughs> I'm just going to finish with this. I know I'm two minutes over, but I want to give you guys something since it's Christmas. Um, not quite yet. So we developed these little booklets Daryl and myself. Remember I was talking about Daryl Holtz earlier about you should take Meet the Bible? He's in the back back there, and he and I collaborate on lots of projects. And one of them that we had the most fun doing was putting together the Bible's Big Story. It's a booklet. Some of you probably have already grabbed it from the Narthex uh, occasionally or the Commons or wherever you find it. They're free, right? And um, Daryl was the general editor. And what we do... and is want to get this in the hands of people to understand the Bible's big story. Remember that slide we looked at? In eight episodes, that's how many I gave you. It just so happens that there's the same episodes in here. It's the same episodes. I want you to have this. I can't give you all a printed one because we just can't print that many because, you know, these cost money. But I will give you a, a PDF version. All you have to do is email me right there at the bottom, chris.foamsby at core.org, and we will send you one for free. Okay, just so you could maybe pass it on to somebody else. You can, there's some questions in there. You can stimulate your thinking, the reflection questions. Uh, this is fantastic. I want you to have one of these. I have eight of them that Daryl has graciously, one for each episode, that Daryl has graciously uh, gotten out of his stash in the back. And I'm going to put them up here. You can fight for them. I'm going to back away. We'll see who gets here the fastest. If you, we run out of these, email me, and I promise you I will get you one. You can always look in the comments in the Narthex. Every once in a while we do replenish them, and you can pick one up, okay? It's your Christmas gift from Daryl. How's that? All right, Daryl? Merry Christmas from Daryl. There he is in the back, all right? And while he's here, let's say, thank him for all the time and energy he's invested in putting together resources like this. All right, let's pray. God, thanks for a great night. Keep us safe as we travel home. Amen. Have a great night.